Hi everyone and welcome to this video on chronic fatigue syndrome and gut health. My name is Alex Manos. I am an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner with a MSc in personalized nutrition and I'm also the co-founder of Health Path, the host of the Health Path podcast and I guess particularly relevant in regards to today's topic um, I do have a personal history with SIBO or small intestine bacterial overgrowth and chronic gut issues that start, started from a, a very young age. Um, it took me essentially 18 years to get just a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome when I was 18. And it was when I started my journey training as a nutritional therapist that I came across SIBO testing. Um, so I think it was when I was around 24 that I did my first SIBO test and understood that that was contributing to my symptoms that had been kind of clustered together and led to that initial diagnosis of IBS. So in regards to today, we really just want to cover the connections between our digestive system or the gut, the gut microbiome, and how imbalances in these can contribute to chronic fatigue syndrome. Now I've kind of put this presentation together both with health practitioners and the general public in mind. So I'm hoping no matter who you are, no matter where you are within your journey, there will be some, some clinical pearls or some tips and tools that you can take away from today's video. But to ensure that we all are really on the same page, just to consider what actually is chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, there's actually more than one definition. They're all very similar, obviously, but we're really looking at severe fatigue that's lasted longer than six months with a presence of at least four symptoms from the list that you see here. So post-exertional malice, for example, do you feel kind of worse after exertion or exercise? Feeling unrefreshed after sleep, even if you've slept 12 hours and all the way through the night. That's such a common symptom or complaint that we see with our customers. Cognitive dysfunction, impaired memory, in, um, inability to recall the correct words during a conversation, and just general sort of brain fog and poor concentration issues. Muscle pain and inflammation type symptoms, sore throats, tender lymph nodes, and new onset headaches. These are all things that we see on a really regular basis with those struggling with chronic fatigue syndrome. And one of the reasons why I wanted to put this specific video and topic together is just because there is such a high comorbidity between chronic fatigue syndrome and gastrointestinal symptoms. And in fact, it can be as high as 92% of patients with CFS exhibit digestive symptoms, bloating, diarrhea or constipation or a fluctuation between the two, perhaps some upper GI symptoms like a little bit of reflux, heartburn or indigestion and abdominal pain would be a really uh, common example as well. So straight away we can start to understand that there has to be some form of connection here. What does connect the fact that so many people diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome have digestive symptoms as well. Before we dive into the specific connection of the gut and chronic fatigue syndrome, I do just want to be transparent about this. I am not here to try and argue that chronic fatigue syndrome starts in the gut. And if we purely focus on improving gut health, we will resolve or improve our symptoms of chronic fatigue because there are numerous factors that can all contribute to the, to, to the development of CFS. We have various infections, and those might not be necessarily within the large intestine, such as a, a parasitic infection. It could be more of a viral infection, such as the Epstein-Barr virus, for example, or there could be more of a systemic bacterial infection, potentially. Hormonal imbalances are incredibly well evidenced in the research, especially around adrenal function and cortisol. One of the trends in the research is really low cortisol levels in saliva testing in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. And there are different theories behind why we see that. 
environmental toxins such as mycotoxins. Some people who have lived in water damaged properties where they've been exposed to mold and damp uh, go on to develop various conditions, including chronic fatigue syndrome. Trauma has been discussed, various nutrient deficiencies such as iron and B vitamins, mitochondrial dysfunction. The mitochondria are often described as the energy factories within the cell. They are found in our cells and it's literally the site where we're creating our energy. So when we have chronic fatigue syndrome, there has to be some degree of mitochondrial dysfunction, people argue. And then really the focus of today, imbalances within the microbiome. So when we appreciate that, we have to think about a holistic approach. And this is a quote that I just wanna read out to sort of finish off giving us the context of today. This disease should be viewed as multifactorial and that the alteration of one body system, such as the microbiome, may not be the exclusive cause. The dysregulation of the microbiome may be variously placed in a disease progression pathway, interfacing with other systems, tipping the body into a persistent imbalance. And this is the functional medicine approach. It's appreciating that all of our bodily systems are interconnected. We can't separate our gut microbiome from our immune system or from our hormonal system or from, to some degree, our mitochondria. These are systems that are interconnected and always speaking with one another. And that's why we need to be taking a functional medicine, holistic, what some people describe as systems biology approach to improving our health. We often criticize conventional medicine, and this is sort of generally speaking, because it's been very reductionistic. It's taken body parts or body systems and broken them down. And that's been fantastic because it's led to us understanding these systems in a lot of detail. However, now what we need to do is we need to put the parts back together. And if we can start to do that, we can start to understand how we can improve our health from this holistic approach. So although a little bit reductionistic in its own right, I do want us to focus on the digestive system today because it is a foundation of health and we just need to appreciate that other bodily systems are gonna impact the microbiome as well. So it's rare that we want to take a purely gut focused approach to chronic fatigue syndrome. There are obviously exceptions and there are times when resolving an imbalance detected within the gut resolves someone's chronic fatigue syndrome. And I have a slide later on in today's presentation to, to really, to, I guess, get that message across ultimately. So in the research, what do we see in regards to imbalances in the gut and chronic fatigue syndrome? Well, there are four big factors for us to consider. Small intestine bacterial overgrowth, leaky gut, dysbiosis, which is just an imbalance in the bacteria or the microbiome within the large intestine or small intestine, and inflammation. Inflammation within this context in the digestive system that might be spilling out into systemic circulation as well. So this paper essentially shows us that in individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome, they appear to have a reduction in the diversity of their microbiome. And they also seem to have um, essentially a leaky gut. What we see is bacteria or bacterial components crossing the gut wall where it initiates an immune response and therefore an inflammatory response. And this is one of the ways that we can consider the connection between an imbalance within the microbiome, particularly an imbalance within the gut lining, contributing to a lot of those symptoms that we mentioned on the second slide. Now, what we see with leaky gut is ultimately that it's been associated with depression, chronic fatigue syndrome, schizophrenia, and irritable bowel syndrome. So the bullet point is a direct quote from this research paper for the practitioners tuning in today. And for the, the public tuning in, essentially the takeaway message 
is that there is this association here and therefore we need to be mindful of the concept of leaky gut within the context of these conditions. Now a common I think um, misconception or mistake that we make is we think that if we can just heal leaky gut we will heal our chronic fatigue syndrome and although there is some truth to that my message here is that you can't necessarily or often heal leaky gut by taking nutrients or compounds that have been shown to restore the integrity or maintain the integrity of the gut lining. So let's just say you do a leaky gut test, it comes back positive, taking some glutamine or some zinc carnosine is unlikely going to be of significant benefit. The question becomes, why do you have leaky gut? And if we can restore the imbalance that's actually contributing to the leaky gut, then we have a significant chance of improving the condition. So leaky gut is like the middle man. And although glutamine, zinc carnosine, and other nutrients or compounds certainly can form part of that overall program, the whole concept of functional medicine is trying to understand the root cause or the mechanism that's contributing to the symptoms. So this is why I, I kind of almost had to reword this because in this study um, by Michael Mize and Jean-Claude Lunis, they do show us that an improvement in leaky gut is associated with an improvement in chronic fatigue syndrome. But what I want to touch on here is the approach they took to get there, which I'm hoping is the next slide. It's not. So I do have a slide later on on this. The, the takeaway message is the program they used, which includes things like zinc and glutamine, but also supplements like NAC, which is an immune modulating antioxidant, anti-inflammatory compound that supports certain detoxification pathways and has a long list of uses within different conditions. So they weren't just really targeting the gut lining with that program. They also did a, a leaky gut diet, essentially, which was quite paleo-like. And they did this for a 10 to 14 month period. So we need to, again, provide that context. This wasn't for a couple of months and then these individuals got better. This was for a substantial amount of time, taking numerous nutrients, both that support the gut lining, but others that have uh, more systemic health properties as well. And I think that's just so important for us to understand the time frames that some of these studies um, essentially have taken to resolve conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome, but also the mechanisms, the whys behind what we're doing. So a question that obviously comes up for a lot of us is, well, if leaky gut is associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, if improving leaky gut seems to improve chronic fatigue syndrome um, through different explanations. So for example, in this study, did the overall program and the amount of time that it went on for obviously help deal with the underlying imbalances that were driving the leaky gut in the first place. And you can see here that leaky gut is associated with dysbiosis and yeast overgrowth, so an imbalance within the microbiome, the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, excessive alcohol, food hypersensitivities or allergies, so if you're eating foods that you are having a reaction to, whether it's an allergic reaction or whether it's more of a food sensitivity or intolerance that is being, um, which is at play here. SIBO, small intestine, bacterial overgrowth, systemic inflammation, psychosocial stresses, certain infections and dietary patterns. These are all things that contribute to leaky gut. So again, we have to think out of these, what do we feel is relevant or appropriate for you as someone suffering with chronic fatigue syndrome? Have you used a lot of these medications? Do you have an imbalance within the microbiome, maybe related to poor dietary patterns earlier in life? Or has there been a lot of stress? One of the most common stories I see in clinic is a adolescent who often is either a 
really competitive athletes or particularly academic, and they've been under huge stress and pressure to achieve. And essentially this accumulation of stress with potentially a lack of sleep or poor sleep hygiene, maybe a little bit too much alcohol if they're sort of 17, 18 years old, um, it's all accumulating to a point where they develop chronic fatigue syndrome. So often in my experience, it's not necessarily one thing. It's an accumulation of things that just push us over the edge into a chronic imbalance that manifests in various ways for some chronic fatigue syndrome. So we've mentioned leaky gut. Now with SIBO, we also see that SIBO has been associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, but also with fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, and quite frankly, a long list of other conditions as well. What we see here in a study that's often cited, it's quite well known, Dr. Pimentel is one of the authors of this study. Uh, Dr. Pimentel, many of you will know that name. He's a big name within the world of SIBO and a big researcher of the condition. And we see that eradication decreases symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, I want to go back to this concept that we can't get too, um, too focused on just the digestive system. Or put another way, if we feel that the main symptoms that you're suffering with are gastric or gastrointestinal related, and you have chronic fatigue syndrome as well, it may be that we start with trying to improve gut health. But if we don't get the improvement we would expect on the programs that we've put in place, we then need to branch out and consider what else could be contributing to your health issues. So this paper, which is definitely one of my favorite papers I've read recently, I actually stumbled across this just the other day, talks about how microbes and viruses outside the gut can also contribute to the illness of chronic fatigue syndrome. And the way this works is some of these, these microbes, these bacteria, viruses, parasites, these kind of microbes, they produce various metabolites and they often have the ability to regulate or control our metabolism and gene expression in a way that just pushes us into a state of illness. And these intracellular pathogens, these organisms that live with inside our cells, are associated and contribute to chronic fatigue syndrome. And this change in genetic expression and this, the inflammation that comes with it is actually one of the things that can drive microbiome dysbiosis. So this is why it's so important that yes, we wanna take a gut focused approach, but it's a bi-directional pathway. We also need to be thinking about how our systemic health could be influencing the health of our microbiome as well. So this is, I think, such a basic, admittedly, but very important point for us all to appreciate, which is you can have a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome and still be functioning very well. You can be going to work, you can have lots of responsibilities, etc. but you might have the brain fog a level of fatigue that's lasted for more than six months and some GI issues. Or you can be absolutely bed bound. There are people who haven't left their bed for months, if not years, with a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. So where are we within this spectrum? Because obviously testing treatment and expectations will be wildly different. And I know that sounds really kind of basic and it's common sense to a, a large degree, but it's a really important point for us to appreciate because my thoughts on this are the further to the right you go, the less we're thinking about basic SIBO or imbalances within the microbiome and leaky gut. And the more we might be thinking about those intracellular systemic infections that are creating uh, what Reed Davis causes, calls sorry, um, metabolic chaos. You know, just your, met your metabolism is now so compromised, it's pushing all these systems into a state of imbalance. And this is leading to 
significant fatigue and a lot of other symptoms, obviously, as well. The more on the left hand side you are, the more likely in my experience that doing something like a SIBO test or a, a gut test or a leaky gut test as well can be really helpful and just shift the needle because it doesn't need shifting as much ultimately. So again, just think, where are you within this spectrum? And that will give you a little sense of what is the most appropriate approach. Do I have fatigue and some niggling symptoms? And therefore, do I want to consider SIBO or gut testing? Or actually, do I need to really focus on um, a more comprehensive, detailed approach where some practitioner, a health practitioner, a professional who's experienced and knowledgeable in those slightly more out the box concepts is gonna be a really important part of that process. So let's just go into possible testing now. So we can consider microbiome diversity, we can consider leaky gut, and we can consider SIBO. And we've discussed how, for example, that microbiome diversity is compromised, it's lower than in individuals who are in a healthier state. And therefore, that's something that we can consider. It's certainly something that we want to work on. We can improve microbiome diversity through, uh, through incorporating a diverse diet. So there's a, a common recommendation of aiming to eat at least 30 different plant foods per week. So that's not just your fruit and your vegetables, but that's your herbs and your spices, your nuts and your seeds, your legumes, your lentils, your pulses, and your beans. Obviously within the context of what you're tolerating at this point in your health journey, but we always want to be consciously looking to diversify the diet. So are there fruits or vegetables or grains that you haven't tried that you could, you could bring into the diet, even in really small portions, as a way to nourish that diversity? We can think about leaky gut testing. Um, we don't recommend doing leaky gut testing in isolation. We've already explained how it's the, a middle part in the process. So while it could be helpful to know whether there's a degree of leaky gut, if it comes, if the test result comes back positive, we then need to ask, well, what's causing this? And that might mean that we actually need to consider doing a SIBO breath test, or we need to consider doing a gut microbiome test to see, is there a bacterial overgrowth or a fungal overgrowth or something else like a parasitic infection that is contributing to some of this? And SIBO testing. When we look at SIBO testing at the, this point in time, we're looking at two gases, hydrogen and methane. And when hydrogen levels are elevated before the 90 minute mark within what is a three hour test, that is indicative of a bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine. And we've seen the research associating SIBO with chronic fatigue syndrome and the eradication of SIBO with improvements in chronic fatigue syndrome. Then we look at methane gas. And when we see methane gas elevated at any point within the test, essentially we are associating that most frequently with constipation. So hydrogen is more often going to contribute to more diarrhea-based symptoms, methane with more constipation-based symptoms. And there's a theory at the moment that when we see these gases come back as uh, flatlining, really kind of ones within the scale, that may indicate that someone's producing excessive levels of hydrogen sulfide. And in fact, Dr. Sarah Myhill, an expert in chronic fatigue syndrome, um, suggests that this kind of fermentative gut is a key part in chronic fatigue syndrome. So when we think about interventions, we can see that Anti-inflammatory diets have been discussed and demonstrated to be beneficial in improving fatigue. So we wanna make sure that we're getting lots of polyphenols into our diet. Just think of colorful foods here. So as much color from fruits and vegetables as possible. We wanna be getting omega-3 fatty acid rich foods, salmon, mackerel, sardines, and those oily, fish that can be a great provider of omega-3. And I would also say we want to make sure that we're getting enough protein into our diet. We're getting enough dietary fiber 
in our diet. These are also going to be supporting different pathways um, within our body that are going to be beneficial from a fatigue improvement perspective. There are some studies indicating that certain strains of probiotics can actually modulate anxiety and inflammation in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And the one that reduced inflammation in this study was Bifidobacterium infantis 35624. Um, I recently did a podcast with Dr. Jason Horolak, um, which is on YouTube, it's on iTunes as well. And in that conversation, we discuss the kind of clinical utilization of probiotics and prebiotics and how thinking about the strain of the bacteria with our probiotics is so important. So I can't recommend that that conversation enough if you're interested in trying probiotics or and prebiotics um, as a way to support gut health. So this is the, um, the paper we mentioned earlier. This slide was much later on than I remembered. Uh, and we mentioned that the authors uh, recommended glutamine, NAC, zinc, and a leaky gut diet for 10 to 14 months. Glutamine and zinc, especially zinc carnosine, um, have been shown to be really helpful in restoring the integrity of the gut lining. And I've mentioned that NAC has numerous properties to it. It's anti-inflammatory, it's an antioxidant, it supports detox pathways. As a result of these things, it's immunomodulatory and it can be used in quite a lot of different conditions. I use it in methane dominant SIBO breath tests. Um, it's a sulfurous compound ultimately. And research has indicated that using sulfurous compounds as a way to um, antagonize the methanogen overgrowth in the small intestine or large intestine may be helpful. And the leaky gut diet um, from memory was, was quite paleo-like. It was reducing or removing grains from the diet, for example. And this is where it gets complicated and confusing, I think, guys, unfortunately, because a lot of the leaky gut diets out there will remove or certainly get you to significantly reduce your intake of grains. But that's not necessarily always needed. There, is, there really isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to this. Can you heal leaky gut and continue to incorporate whole grains in your diet? Some of you, absolutely yes. Some of you, potentially not. It depends on your unique case and your unique state of health at this point in your journey. So there has to be, I think, a little bit of trial and error here. Uh, there is no concrete answer a lot of the time. And I think we have to get comfortable in that little bit of unknown. How do you feel if you were to remove grains for, let's say, a month? That's probably a good chunk of time to understand how your body is responding to having them or not having them, ultimately. Now, we've got some podcasts um, discussing SIBO. We have a very short video on our YouTube channel that talks about the SIBO test itself and when we might want to consider using it and how it works. But we have kind of the natural and the medical approach. The medical approach is via antibiotics. You may get recommended a medical prokinetic. Sometimes, dependent on the um, practitioner, prebiotics can be recommended. So a gastroenterologist who um, has read some of the more recent research will certainly recommend prebiotics and potentially a probiotic but normally that's something like just VSL number three. It's kind of there, the go-to it seems in the conventional medicine approach. Now, taking a slightly more natural approach for want of a better term, we can use herbal antimicrobials such as oregano oil. Ginger-based supplements are often prokinetics. There's one called Motil Pro by Pure Encapsulations, for example. Uh, prebiotics are certainly something to still consider. And with our probiotics, we can get quite personal depending on what your symptoms are and what it is that we're trying to actually achieve. So specific strains of bacteria can be particularly beneficial for constipation, others for diarrhea, others for abdominal pain, others for anxiety. 
So really, depending on what's going on in your unique case, we can get somewhat personalized with our probiotic recommendations. And then there may just be some additional support that we feel is needed based on your test results or just your symptoms. So we might consider some digestive enzymes. We might support uh, the biliary system or bile. Bile helps us break down and digest our fats within the diet. So if there's an issue in the liver or gallbladder and therefore an issue with bile, that can have quite a big impact on our ability to break down our fats and therefore think about the consequences to our fat soluble nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E. These aren't going to be absorbed as well as they could be if we're not actually breaking down our fats as well as we could be. And we might need to consider something like stomach acidity. Um, hypochlorhydria, which is the technical term for low stomach acid, I think is incredibly common in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. And one way that we can think about this is very simple. If you are not producing adequate levels of energy at a cellular level, you are going to experience some degree of fatigue and certain systems, pathways, processes aren't going to have the energy required to produce um, hydrochloric acid or stomach acids, digestive enzymes, whatever it may be. So unless that cell is healthy and has the, um, the nutrients and tools it needs to actually produce adequate levels of energy, systemically, we're going to struggle ultimately. And then we can think about specific nutrients. We mentioned at the beginning that things like B vitamins and iron deficiency uh, can easily contribute to fatigue. So in some cases, it might be that someone has undiagnosed iron deficiency anemia and giving them some iron or getting them to uh, reintroduce, let's say, some red meat into the diet can be a complete game changer. But other nutrients in the research that have been discussed are vitamin C, zinc, magnesium, L-carnitine, um, essential fatty acids, and coenzyme Q10. And then I just wanted to touch on, you know, some of the alternative interventions. Body awareness can, can have a role to play within chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. We need to be mindful um, of the quality of these studies, but my experience and my beliefs are that this can be a huge factor. And for now, think about body awareness as uh, I guess almost like a physiotherapy style, Tai Chi yoga style practice. It's so important, I think, that all of us, no matter where we are within our health journeys, have a practice around embodiment of kind of coming back into our body. I can put my hand up and um, confess that I, to this day, can get stuck in my head. Uh, I'm overthinking whether that's related to challenges in my day-to-day -day life or business or family, whatever it may be. And sometimes I think there can be a defensive mechanism where we kind of end up staying in our head and we're disembodied. We're not feeling what needs to be felt. And for those of you that know the work of people like um, Dr. Gabor Mate or Peter Levine will be very familiar with these concepts. And if you're not familiar with these concepts or those practitioners, I can't recommend enough that you go onto Google, go onto YouTube, go onto Amazon and check out their books and interviews, uh, because I think it's a really important piece of the puzzle when we're struggling with uh, most, if not all, chronic health issues. But something as simple as Tai Chi, you know, can you find some videos on YouTube and do a minute, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, um, however frequently is achievable for you. Um, Mindfulness-based practices have been shown to be beneficial. So we've got a lot of tools within our toolkit that we can consider. And then we have fecal microbiota or microbiome transplants. Um, I've done an episode with the Taymount Clinic in the UK. They are a clinic that specialize in FMT. And interestingly, study shows that FMT is a safe and promising treatment for CFS associated with IBS. We need more trials, we need more evidence, but it's really exciting to see that this is a potential 
um, other option for people struggling with chronic fatigue syndrome uh, associated with digestive symptoms. And again, just to kind of finish off and remind us that there are other things that need to be considered. So a, an approach ultimately needs to be personalized. And that can only happen if we have a deep understanding of someone's health history and what I describe as the chronological timeline of how things have developed. You know, were they um, a vaginal birth or a C-section? Were they breastfed or bottle fed? Were there any adverse childhood events or traumas, stresses in the first seven, eight years of life? What was that, what's that person's diet like? Been, what has that person's diet been like throughout their lifetime? How many courses of antibiotics have they had? Have they had any other types of stresses, financial stresses, unemployment? When symptoms started, especially then, what was going on in the life over the year maybe before that? Can we, can we truly understand what may have contributed to this? And as I said earlier, sometimes it's just an accumulation of these things and someone's resiliency has become compromised. And we need to focus ultimately on nourishing, on strengthening, on building that person's resilience back up. And we can do that through so many different lifestyle strategies. So remember, don't get too bogged down in one thing. And if you're feeling overwhelmed or confused, then please reach out, reach out to Health Path, reach out to a local health practitioner um, and ask for a little bit of guidance and support because we do truly understand and appreciate how overwhelming and complicated sometimes this can be with so much information now freely available, of which unfortunately so much of it is contradictory as well. And that's because it has to be personalized to you. So to learn more about us, to, to contact us, you can head over to our website, healthpath.com, or you could book a free 15 minute consultation if you're interested in any of the functional gut testing that we offer. We offer SIBO breath tests uh, that can be done at home. We offer stool microbiome gut tests that can be done at home. We have a urinary leaky gut test, but we also look at cortisol um, in saliva, and we also have food sensitivity testing for those that are interested in those tests as well. So thank you for listening, everyone. I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's given you some options moving forwards. And as always, if you have any thoughts, if you have any questions, if you have any feedback, then reach out to us. You've got our details, leave a comment. If you've enjoyed the video, please do like and leave a comment as well. It would be greatly appreciated. And we wish you all the best on your health journey.